Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture, Strategi Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss business intelligence and data analytics and architected approach sponsored today by Katonagraph. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And to open the chat or the Q&A panels, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Abby for a brief word from our sponsor, Katonograph. Abby, hello and welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Shannon. I hope you are able to see my screen. Looks good, yep. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar today. Um, I'm Abby, Abby Sheikh Mehta from Katana Graph. I had the field engineering team, and I'll take a few minutes of yours to give you an introduction about Katana Graph before I pass it on to Donna to talk about uh, you know, the purpose for which we are here today. So um, about Katana Graph, uh, we are a graph intelligence platform. We are a technology built for high performance, scale out graph processing and analytics. Uh, our company is a COVID child. We were, we were set up as a business unit in March, 2020. Um, it may give you an impression that it's a very new company, but in reality, our co-founders, Keisha Pengali and Chris Rosbach have been professors at UT Austin, where our engine was developed over a decade of research by various different DARPA funded projects. So uh, our technology is very well proven out. And as soon as this business entity was formed, the top notch investors from the world, as you can see on your screen, came back and gave us a pretty big series A round. And that has led to many commercial engagements on one front where we are dealing with many Fortune 100 companies in financial services and healthcare side. Uh, if you want to know more about us, please visit our website, that's katanagraph.com. So here is a glimpse into our uh, leadership team. It's a very well combined, very balanced uh, view of technology, PhDs, and, and the business acumen. Uh, and the industries what we serve are of pretty wide variety. We are seeing a lot of traction all across the industry of healthcare, life sciences, financial services, uh, from very generic to very specific use cases of fraud detection, anti-money laundering, you know, from capital markets areas to talking about wealth management. So various different variety of spaces where you're dealing with big data, interlinked, interconnected data, Katana Graph technology comes into play because it's a distributed graph processing platform. And why people are trusting Katana uh, a lot these days is because we're, our technology has been proven out on billions of records, over trillions of records and terabytes of data sets. We have unmatched performance of which is 10 to 100 times faster than some proven technologies and it's cloud agnostic. You can run it on uh, any cloud vendor I and mean, whatever your poison is, we kind of serve it. Our, our system has scaled up to a 256 machine. So all in all, I will take one more slide for you guys before I pass it on back to you, Donna. What we do in the graph compute domain is we provide you all the basic capabilities backed by open cipher programming language of a graph database for querying capability, link depth analysis, multi-hop, shortest distance, shortest path, uh, you know, giving you huge advantage over the RDBMS technology in terms of ad hoc uh, analytics. And of course, we have our biggest value comes in graph analytics and mining space where graph algorithms, which be backed by our on-demand partitioning policies and heterogeneous scalability can run many complicated graph processing uh, uh, algorithms in parallel. Uh, along with that, we are also seeing a lot of traction with the latest technology trends out there around graph neural networks. So if you have any such interest, feel free to reach out to us and I will pass it on to Donna to discuss more about business intelligence and data analytics and see what kind of role graph can play and fit, you know, fit in there. Thank you very much. 
Bobby, thank you so much for kicking us off. And thank you to Katonograph for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. And if you have questions for Avi or about Katonograph, you may submit your questions in the Q&A panel as he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. And now let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get her presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these each month and, and always nice to see some familiar names in the chat. We have a very loyal following at Dataversity, so um, awesome group of people. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, as, as I just sort of alluded to, this is a monthly series, so uh, I saw some new names on, on the list, which is great. If this is your first time joining either this series or Dataversity, um, all of the previous recordings, and that's always the first question people ask, is that will this be recorded? Will we get the slides? Yes, yes. Um, and then all, I, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon, all of the materials from Dataversity are kept in perpetuity from not only this year or, or this series, but other series um, all, all in the past. So uh, please take advantage of those. And then also would love you to join us in some of the upcoming ones. Next month is a topic near and dear to my heart, metadata management. Um, and, and you'll see the other list of topics uh, for the rest of the year. So, uh, but the reason we are talking today is BI analytics architecture um, and a little bit of intro there from the sponsor, which is great uh, because more and more organizations really are, I know it's trite and, and we keep hearing that buzzword, but becoming data-driven and a big part of data-driven is BI analytics. You know, some of the graph um, use cases that were mentioned in the intro, uh, that's great. Um, but where my sort of soapbox comes is that only works well when you have a strong architecture behind it. So um, analytics are great, the new visualization tools and some of the great new viz, you know, that the people can do is, is wonderful, but um, where, you know, I, I sort of nerd out in my realm is that doesn't work well and the numbers won't be right unless you have that strong or won't perform unless you have that strong architecture behind it. So we'll kind of go into that um, in this presentation. So um, because we're data driven, we always like to start with stats and, and data. So um, each year, um, Global Data Strategy and uh, the Data Diversity kind of work together on a, a trends paper, trends and data management which I find super interesting because some themes sort of say stay, stay consistent, some change year over year, some grow over time. The one that tends to stay consistent over time um, is that reporting and analytics are really key drivers to a lot of what we're doing in data management. So you can see that one in the middle, uh, reporting and analytics is a key driver. Um, the fact that data is seen as a strategic asset is, is one of those in the category that we see that growing over and over uh, year over year. So probably no one in this call is surprised at, at that. I think most of us in this call probably agree with that, but I think the rest of the industry, the rest of the, the quote, the business that we tend to say, is, is stepping up and, and really wanting to do more with data, which then drives the need for analytics. Um, what I was heartened to see, and I hope that this one grows over time, because even though it's bigger than 50%, it wasn't well over 50%, um, or I would have said that, um, but that, that people have specifically said that they see improved collaboration um, through a defined data architecture. And really, when we want to get reporting and analytics and being data driven, that's all about collaboration and getting the numbers right and all of that. So glad that folks called that out specifically, um, but would love to see that kind of grow over time. Um, uh, also from the survey that hopefully folks will find interesting is, you know, this is when we asked what are, are the main goals and drivers for, and this was data management more broadly, but just think data, what are you trying to do with data? Um, really, again, reporting analytics is at the top, continues at the top and, and probably will keep growing. That said, there's a lot of other use cases for data, operational data, and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, topic of this presentation and top of mind for many, many folks across the org and across the industry is and continues to be reporting and, and analytics. And I, and I see those as, separate, which could be a whole other discussion, but they are kind of distinct things. Um, if anyone joined our webinar last month, we kind of used this example. Last month was on data literacy and kind of the need for data literacy. And when you read a dashboard, 
um, a big drive of data li literacy is, well, firstly, are, are you even using a dashboard? Are we a data-driven culture that doesn't go on gut feel? Um, you know, I'm a sales org. I really want to understand my customer and, and how trends over time are going, not the answer of, oh, I know my customers. I've been doing this for 20 years, which may be true, um, but we can also learn from the data. So, you know, that's a big part of, are we even using dashboards? And but then the next question is, you know, are these numbers right? And do we have the right data quality behind it and the right data governance and support? So you know, kind of a little a mnemonic we had in the last session was this little owl kind of asking, you know, what, what about the data? The dashboard's pretty. The visit, well, actually, this one isn't particularly pretty. I apologize. Um, but the visualization might be nice. Um, but what about the data? So kind of want to go across that theme. You know, last month we sort of hinted at this, this session which will delve into that last bullet at the bottom, which is the architecture. So, and, and anything in data management has crossover. Um, so uh, often it's hard to get the quality right or the governance right if you don't have that right, right correct architecture, uh, but also just things like performance or, you know, are we using the right tool for the right job? And are we thinking of the architecture? So, you know, um, we, uh, I do this for a living. I run a company called Global Data Strategy and, and a lot of the anecdotes from <laughs> these presentations kind of come from real life. Um, and a good trend that I am seeing is that more and more companies are become data, becoming data driven. You know, I've been doing this for longer than I want to admit. And, you know, in the old days, folks have stayed with data management. You know, we, we all we have worked in or many of us have worked in government or financial services. Um, you know, some of the folks that have been doing data management the longest. What I find fun about my job is that, you know, I've worked with small museums and nonprofits and, you know, companies that, you know, typically wouldn't maybe have been as data driven in the past, but now everyone is. So that, that's a positive. I do see though, uh, not every, or a lot of folks can sort of go in and, and, and it's fun to build the, the visualizations and the dashboards and the tools that have come a long way. It's a little harder to understand that architecture behind it and what's the right, best solution out there. And it does not, um, it helped that there are a lot of solutions out there and and to tease the vendors a little bit i know there's one on the call um but you know a lot of folks have a vested interest in saying well our solution is the best and, that, and the speaker did not say that today um but you know there's a lot of um you know i don't i, I don't say it goes as far as misinformation but you know a lot of vested inter information in our solution is best right so that is an exciting time to be in data management um because there's a lot of options and a lot of choices but with choices also becomes a little bit of stress and risk, right? There's a cacophony of options, I would say, out there in terms of what you can choose. Um, you know, is it the good old fashioned data warehouse? Um, and I will kind of give the punchline already. Yes, that still exists and is still very valid. It is not old fashioned. Um, it, it is tried and true and tested and, and there's a difference, right? It, is it the only tool in the toolkit? Absolutely not, right? Um, what about the data lake? Is that a I'm old enough that that was a hot trend and that was a fad and now, you know, it was an old, old school thing that <laughs> maybe is a, is a data swamp, right? Or now do we have a data lake house um, or a data hub, maybe data warehouse and data lake and data lake house. We just do data hub. Well, what's a data hub? Isn't that, is that the same thing as, you know, uh, oops, sorry, uh, an, an MDM hub, um, a data mesh. That's the new thing. We do data mesh. No, wait, data fabric, data clothing. Data, isn't that the same as data virtualization? I, I think, no, we just need a data catalog to put all our data in one place. No, no, we don't have a data catalog. I think you mean metadata catalog. Well, no, maybe it's a data marketplace or let's put it all in a knowledge graph. That sounds great. Or is it relational, non-relational stars? Give us equal, you can just, you know, that might be how your brain is feeling trying to keep up with things. And, and I do, <laughs> what I do for a living. Um, and even I have been doing this for years and years and years start to get confused. Did I just miss something? Like, like you know, you know, I, you know, I kind of look around the house and, and just say, is it a, a, a data kitchen? Wait, no, that seems already come up with that. Is a data table? Like, swear, yep, that one's been new. A data lamp, you know, I don't know, just look around the room. Um, and I always say with that, and, and many of us um, has a, uh, I see a note that I might be fading and coming back. Is the sound okay? Issues? You're walking away from the mic a little bit, but um, I am not. I will just try to. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll keep going. Um, so uh, I always go back to first principles, and I think you know universities and, and schools that are teaching this. That's the best way to think this. What is the right tool uh, for the right job? Um, 
So, uh, I, and this isn't the only way to look at things, but it is a helpful uh, point. Is <laughs> data lamp is that a light bulb moment? Love it. Um, what are people using in the real world? Doesn't mean that people are always right, uh, but it does give a good indicator of of what, you know, amongst all the things out there, what is has been tried and true. And again, we've been doing this survey for, gosh, I don't even remember, so it's probably 10 years now. Uh, data warehousing and business intelligence generally are and continue to be at the top. Um, of things that people are integrating. And this isn't necessarily all around reporting. There's other areas, you know, that are all overlapping and that could be a whole conversation of what's the difference between governance and architecture and modeling, et cetera. But, um, you know, there are other uh, other things to explore, but nothing wrong with building a data warehouse and BI. Um, and a lot of the, the organizations that are doing some of the uh, more, you know, modern or cutting edge, you know, data science, AI, graph uh, patterns that were mentioned, um, also do that in conjunction with a data warehouse. Doesn't mean one is better than the other, and you'll hear me continue to rant about that. They're just different use cases and different tools in the toolbox. So I found this sort of interesting as part of that survey. You know, are you using a data lake? Not as many as you would think, but many who are, are using it in conjunction with a data warehouse, which makes sense, right? If I'm trying to understand, um, total revenue by region by sales rep, um, that's a great use case for a data warehouse. And I probably want those numbers to be right. You know, if I'm trying to do some exploratory use cases and do some social media analytics or, you know, real-time streaming of product um, sensor data feedback, great use for a data lake. Could those be combined for some really great insights? Of course. Um, so um, great way to think of that. When one is building an architecture, and I highly recommend you do and write it down, even if it's just a, a, a whiteboard of you know, how do these things fit together, um, they do often fit together with a nice, um, you know, kind of zoned approach of, you know, what, and I kind of, this is a fake fictitious, but based on several real world patterns, you know, what what is kind of broadly called those enterprise systems of record, right? Things like master and reference data, your, your good old fashioned data warehouse, um, a, a data mart, what's the difference between those? That could be a whole other session, right? But you know, the fact that you're doing data science and, and advanced analytics maybe, or, or some data discovery off the lightly modeled data or some exploratory data is only augmented by things like master and reference data, right? I would think if I were a data scientist, um, wouldn't it be better to have clean data to be working with? You know, plenty of surveys out there that, you know, unfortunately a, a large part of the data scientist day is spent cleaning data rather than you know, actually doing the analytics on it. So uh, again, that box in the green only helps everyone, but that's a whole different way of modeling and, and managing and governing the data than maybe some more exploratory analytics. But what you put on top of that, whether it's, um, you know, standard BI reports or visualizations or self-service BI, really, um, you know, can be several patterns behind it, one of which may be a warehouse. You know, governance should go across all of those layers. Maybe it's more lightly governed on the left, um, maybe not. Maybe maybe you have some really you know sensitive health data coming from some of the stuff in the lake. Doesn't mean just because it's in the lake, it's it's sort of open <laughs> open season. Um, so your security and your privacy and your PII is is still very important. Uh, one of the stories I I like to tell, and the person and company is is nameless, but we were building a model like this, and we were talking about the PII aspect and you know personally identifiable information um, that should be obviously secured. And in this case, it was sort of health information as well. It was credit card information. Um, and we were going through this model and, and one of the younger gentlemen on the team raised his hand. He's like, so, so I shouldn't be putting the credit card data out in the, in the, you know, sandbox in the cloud for the exploration. Um, and the boss basically said, send Jeep, we're going to, oh, I guess I didn't remain late, nameless today. <laughs> Person X, uh, we'll, we'll talk after work. Yeah. You, you can't, you know, just sort of take customer data and just dump it out somewhere to do some playing around with. So, you know, the fact that the security and privacy and governance should go across all of the layers, regardless of the technology. Um, and, and if you've been on my, my sessions, you've seen this slide before. Um, this is kind of our framework that we use at Global Data Strategy, but it, it does sort of speak to the fact that, you know, BI and analytics, you'll see they're kind of right there in the center. Um, but there's a lot of things around that, that that make that sing. So whether it's governance or you know, even having your overall strategy of where, where analytics fits in. Are you doing self-service? Is it all enterprise? Is it et cetera, et cetera? What's the, what's the quality of that? And of course, the architecture behind that is a big piece of it. Um, so I, I did want to kind of get into that idea of the design aspect of data architecture. So 
some of the things we talked about before were maybe you know platform or or, or hardware or, or, or styles um but there's a lot of aspects some of it is the business kind of layer of your bi in your analytics and that's often kind of what is sort of overlooked or i don't want to say forgotten but maybe not focused on as, as much um again if you've joined these you full disclosure i'm a big fan of data modeling at, at all levels i think it you know really is a proactive way to understand things and yes i have a, a Cat, uh, you know, inventory of data modeling cartoons out there. Um, but here's one, and maybe it's not funny if you haven't done this, and maybe it's just not funny. But um, you know, we've all probably been here. Hey, we, we've built the applications. We're done with testing. We've got this great new marketing application. Just wondering, what do we mean by a customer? Um, and and maybe that's not funny until you've gone through it. But um, there's a lot of different areas of customer. What is even a customer? It, it, you know, and I have worked for been a member of you know, large corporations that have made very embarrassing mistakes. We work with one where they sent out um, kind of renewal notices to people who are prospects. Um, you know, so when you talk to a salesperson, I'm going to go talk to a customer. Generally, often they mean a, a non-customer, someone they're trying to sell to, but kind of colloquially, we use the word customer. In this case, they literally went to the kind of, you know, uh, pre-sales database and, and, and use that because the database literally was called customer. Not a great way to kind of do your data governance. Um, you know, a lot of different flavors of mistakes of, of, of about that, or even, you know, is, is it a lapsed customer? Does that person on maintenance, do they, do the customer of different account types? Is it a premium customer, et cetera, et cetera. So anyone in data governance um, or, or data management or data architecture knows that that should be a big part of that. And, and, and often, and I, I don't know, I see, less of this but maybe again we have a filtered audience because generally folks we work with do data models um but there has been kind of in the past oh, let's just not do the model that's so we unwieldy and it's going to take so long it's just a lot faster to just start building it we'll kind of do modeling later um but uh i guess I mean, my mom used to always say if you don't have time to do it right you have time to do it again um and and you will answer that question of what is a customer or what is a patient or what is a student or et cetera, uh, what is a citizen? It's just, do you wanna do it when you're fixing it or do you wanna do it up front? Um, and uh, you know, I, one of the comments uh, from Gail, you know, every CRM system has that idea of a customer, a contact, a prospect. And you know, I, I, I ranted over Twitter the other day, I was actually reviewing you know, I, I, a model and it literally had a party related to a thing. And I said, yeah, that's very reusable, um, but that tells me nothing about this company. One of the things I love about data modeling is you can tell almost everything about a company by kind of a one page data model. Um, and yes, maybe behind an ERP system or a CRM system there, there is a party table or an account table, but how that's filtered, what, what flags you use, what account types really make a customer. Literally was just on a call right before this going through that. What account types um, in, in one of these big CRMs and how do people use it and how is it entered, you know, is a big part of that. So to me, this is that business level modeling that absolutely cannot be skipped. Um, but there's levels of, of data models. There's that that business level, whether it's up at the enterprise subject areas, um, uh, <laughs> the subject areas, or down at kind of that business level with the conceptual uh, model of that sort of both of those are sort of where is, what is a customer? Um, what What is a product? Um, working with a company right now with, with full seriousness and no, no irony of that says, we don't know what a product is in our company. We're successful, we're a multi-billion dollar company, we're making a lot of money. But if my management asked me to tell me revenue by product, we can't do that. We don't know what our products are. And again, that's your core of the business that modeling that revealed a lot of interesting things across the data and across the business processes as well. Uh, once you get down to the logical, that's still a business centric uh, view, but you are, and that could be a whole debate, a webinar of how physical is a logical. <laughs> does, it, do, does it does it does it need to have a relational database behind it, um, or, or is it kind of business rule centric? Uh, again, that could be a full webinar, but it really should be at the business level of using business terms, using business logic, and getting those business rules around the the data. Um, and both of those are really critical to understanding um, 
the business. So uh, that that is, is sort of uh, a definite when you're trying to build those reports. Why does this matter? And we'll talk about this more in the presentation. Give, please give me a report showing um, products by customer by region. What's well, a product? What's a customer? What's a region? And then I now want to say what are total sales? Um, you know, how do we calculate total sale? All, all of that needs to really be defined. Um, and then, of course, the physical model. And I will get into this. Um, because I've talked a lot at the business level, but uh, again, years and years of this physical stuff is, is hard and, and tech is super fun, but most of the problems we run into that we need to fix um, are at that business level. It's a business rule that wasn't described. I mean, yes, there's performance issues and things like that from having a badly designed database, but generally it's the business rules that are gonna cause your big problems. Uh, so getting that right up front, super, super important. Beginning with the end in mind was one of the comments there. Um, so, but yeah, but the physical model, and, and again, not everything needs to be in a relational database, right? And we have a lot more options, a graph model, right? That's, you know, um, was talked about in the beginning. Um, there's key value pairs, et cetera. But again, and, and, and uh, pick on the vendors, pick on people, human nature, right? There's always that, well, we have, we have no SQL now. We don't need SQL. That's just silly. You know, we need both. <laughs> they both have their place and just, you know, don't fall into that trap, but do think very carefully about that. There isn't only one option for your physical data. Um, I'm working with a customer, had a long day already today, <laughs> another customer where that whole idea of they had customer defined, they were very far along, but then what are the different physical instantiations of customer in those different use cases? Yes, they had graph and yes, they had uh, relational third normal form and they also had star schema and they also had operational data and they also were starting to build MDM and all of them were correct. But then how do you get that um, architecture together? So I, I, I have really strong feeling that they will be successful because they are asking, there's some hard questions in there, where's the overlap, but they're asking them um, in, 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 at the get-go <laughs> before they get too much further. So uh, good to do that. So as I kind of mentioned, there's physical different physical models for different use cases and, and a lot of tools in the toolkit don't just use the hammer. <laughs> Not everything is a nail, right? So there's another data modeling cartoon. You thought you were done. Um, and maybe that's not funny either, but I'm getting into third normal form, funny, okay. So um, if anyone doesn't know what that is, that, that's a great way to increase your data quality and ensure consistency. If you're thinking of asset transactions, these are great when you do have an operational um, database. I wanna make sure that my records match up and I'm using referential integrity, great use uh, for your relational database. And that's one of the reasons they are still valuable and is still well used. I would say when you use them, use them correctly. I mean, the number of databases I look at when we come in and um, that don't have keys or referential integrity to find it. And sometimes that's a design choice, um, but often it's, I think folks just don't have those fundamentals of what a relational database was meant for and how to use that wisely. Um, kind of like, and I'm guilty of this, using an Excel spreadsheet for just you know a list of my my friends or their phone number, you know, that's not really, you know, it's a, it's a financial modeling tool and I'm using it for something else. Um, and then I complain that the formatting doesn't work well with Excel and I can't, you know, indent things. And like, it's not because you're using a tool for it, not what it's, what it's not meant to be. Um, so I do it myself. We all do it. Uh, star schema. And, and you know, is that uh, is that still old fashioned? Do we need that? I was in a webinar earlier this year. You know, is the star schema dead? Um, no. I mean, there's 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 part of the reason one does a star schema is for performance. Are the systems built nowadays and the hardware and and, and systems a lot faster that you don't need to necessarily put it in the star schema to get performance, yes. But is there just an, a, a human friendly log logical way of organizing data that you have a fact like total sales by region, by product, by campaign, by, <laughs> yes. Um, and so that ability to slice and dice and have a nice semantic layer um, is still, still in use and still super, super helpful. Um, However, there's other options, no SQL. Um, you know, I, I do want that fast retrieval. I'm building a website and I want you know, high bait data vol vol volumes. I do want to have a more flexible pattern for change. Great, great choice for that. And that's just the beginning. There's hierarchies, there's XML, there's graph, there's good old fashioned COBOL copy books that we still run into and we can laugh at that. Um, but they work. <laughs> I always think of that. Why are we still using the mainframe? And I think, and, and you know, we can't use the mainframe. That's old fat. I'm not. I'm not proposing necessarily to start with a new mainframe as your new application with all the options out now. Um, but when people sort of roll their eyes and, and say hey, this thing was built in the '60s or whatever, and I think it's still running, it's still working. <laughs> it's built in the '60s, so we can't necessarily poo-poo 
you know, some of those designs. Um, but again, there's a lot more options, you know, S3, three buckets. Would I say do that for your enterprise data warehouse? No, but is it a great way to store information at low cost? Yes. Uh, data vault, you know, great way to store data kind of um, as an initial kind of storage, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of different options. And, and my rant that actually is not over, I lied, just said rant over there in the lower right, <laughs> we'll continue ranting, <laughs> um, that no modeling technique is inherently better than another. It's, it's sort of like saying a screwdriver is better than a hammer. Um, both are good. They just have different use cases. It's only a problem when you know, that old fashioned saying, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail and, and don't do that. <laughs> there you go. There's the, there's the webinar. Don't do that. Um, so the question I just asked, is the poor old good old fashioned star schema dead? I already gave the answer. It's not dead. Ain't dead. Was that Monty Python skit? <laughs> Not dead yet. Anyway, maybe I've had too much coffee today. Um, it still is a very user-friendly and performant way to do that classic slicing and, and dicing. So if folks aren't familiar with the star schema, um, you know, it sort of can, can theoretically feel like it's being shaped like a star, thus the name. So at the center are sort of your, your facts or, or your measures. That those I always like to think of it, what are you reporting on? You know, I'm reporting on sales transaction or patient visits or things you're basically counting. So that's what you're reporting on. And then the things you're reporting by are generally your di dimensions, you know, and, and I want to report by customer, by product, by, you know, I've said that enough times in this webinar. Um, often there's this term of, you know, a conformed dimension uh, where that's often your master data or your reference data. You know, no surprise that some of these we talked already, that single view of customer, that single view of product are your master data efforts. And so the more you clean that up, again, the whole topic of this webinar is an architected approach to reporting analytics. I don't think, um, and, I'll, and I'll fight them after the webinar, um, there's any report, you know, data scientist, uh, BI analytics person that doesn't want good, nice, clean master data that they can work with. Do they want to build it? Maybe not. That's a whole discipline. Um, but if someone said, do you want to clean um, deduplicated augmented with with industry perfect data of all your customers yeah <laughs> sends, sends along and uh, so that's this idea of certainly ain't old-fashioned it's, it's it's even more relevant with these new technologies i want to build a graph database and see all my connections between customers if i don't have the right customer it's not going to work so well we actually had a really advanced financial services customer who is doing you know graph patterns and a lot of advanced analytics on their on, on their customers um and had a great team doing that. The problem was when they tried to integrate that with their customer list, they didn't have good master data. So they didn't know if, if Joe Smith was a, a multi-billion dollar high net worth customer or Joe Smith was the Joe Smith who had just filed bankruptcy, you know? So um, yeah, people don't always wait, wait for it. And you don't always have to wait for it. I mean, there's a, there is a case for, you know, let's do just enough for now. Let's do some you know, graph patterns on the, on the data to, to get some initial exploration as we build master data. You, know, you can't realistically stop the whole company <laughs> trying to selling that to management. You know, we need to stop operations for the next six months while we get our master data right. You know, that's, you're literally, move, you know, changing the wings on a moving plane, which makes master data sometimes hard. Um, but yeah, it does have to be done. And the more you can do that up front, um, then you don't have to do as much cleanup. Second rant over. Um, so yes, it, it is still a good, a good a good tool to use. It's just not the only tool in the toolbox. And another good old-fashioned, well-used tool that business users love. I I, um, I have sort of stopped using this a bit in my own practice, uh, full disclosure, um, and brought it back. The, the good old bus matrix, um, which is a nice business-centric tool as you're defining your your BI and your analytics. Um, and I walked into a meeting. <laughs> I get a lot of characters from my clients, and one of them it was a. He was a senior financial analyst, and, and we walk in the room, and he goes, data people, bus matrix, bus matrix, so, and he was sort of getting annoying in sort of a funny way, so we started using the bus matrix, and then we, we sort of add that in almost every every project now, because it is just so helpful, you know, if, again, what are we reporting by, and there's different flavors of bus matrices, uh, one of the ones we use is, you know, what are we reporting by, how do we define, and this could go into your glossary, or your data catalog, or your metadata catalog, or your data lamp, or whatever you want to call it. Um, what do we mean by total sales uh, and wholesale revenue and, and what's the difference, et cetera? Uh, so that's what we're reporting by. And then what are we reporting on? 
you know, I want to know revenue by location, by sales rep, by product, and maybe an, maybe another report just wants location by product for, for the wholesale stuff. Um, so a great way to map out a nice, easy to use. Generally, we have a little prettier one than this, but um, nice, intuitive way for business people to understand and a great way for a roadmap, right? Because this, this very simple grid, which, yes, I do in a spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, I just picked on spreadsheets, but um, this is fine on a spreadsheet. There's probably other tools out there. Uh, you know, it's a it's a glossary um, exercise. And how do we meet by total sales revenue? It's it's a, a governance exercise. It's a master and reference data exercise. It's a data warehouse exercise, right? Th th this one simple graph can really be a roadmap uh, for moving forward of how you, how you build things out. So uh, big fan of the good old bus matrix. Bring it back. Um, but there are many design patterns sort of behind the scenes. So again, I, I consider something like a bus matrix, um, a requirements doc, um, which sort of leads itself to the star schema. But you know, you might have come very different things. We we want website clicks by minute across our website. Probably wouldn't use a star schema set. So if the stuff across the left is um, you know website clicks and and across the right is by second, you know maybe this doesn't lead itself to a Star Schema Warehouse, maybe, um, but um, there are other tools out there. So again, if you haven't heard me say it 16 times in this webinar, there's a lot of, lot of options, no, no one size fits all. Um, so even within the tried and true warehouse, still arguments over, you know, is it Inman, is it Kimball, um, is it relational, is it Star Schema? Uh, there's a case for both, right? The, uh, a nice um, use case for the kind of relational model is getting that, you know, the, the, the data quality and then the single view of things um, like, um, you know, single view of customer and things like that when I then want to report on it in either an enterprise a warehouse or a mart. Um, a, a star scheme is great for slicing and dicing. Um, so yeah, use them both. <laughs> Go big, right? There's a lot of tools. Uh, data Vault is kind of growing in popularity, especially in, in Europe. Um, it, it is a, you know, a flexible way to store the data um, as you're discovering it. Is it as easy for reporting? Maybe not. Um, so again, there's good tools for each. You know that that column data, a kind of flipping flipping the columns and the rows for performance is another great tool in the toolbox. That might be a great answer to the website traffic thing we were looking at. Um, or just flatten everything out, right? I, I, why do we need everything in third normal form as a data modeler? My answer is you don't, right? Maybe you do, and again, these can all work together. Maybe you do have it in third normal form. To, to rationalize it and get your master data and then flatten it for the, the data science team because I would love a nice clean list of all my customer data flattened out so I can do analytics on it, right? Um, a graph, a great way to, to discover those connections and patterns, fraud detection patterns between customers. And, and I, these can also be iterative. So we have one customer who's, you know, their main goal is customer master data and it will take them years. It's a massive company. Um, they're kind of doing graph first in the fact that graft isn't necessarily the tool that's going to cleanse it and, and master it, but they're discovering those patterns that then can be fed into their rules engine, which is um, a, their true master data management. So it was kind of a good, you know, both are tools in the toolkit. They will continue to use graph as they build out um, back to the, you know, can we wait and get all the data perfect before we do anything? Unfortunately, you can't, um, but they're kind of doing both in parallel. They're, they're, they're smart enough to, not be necessarily pushing the, they, they can make some educated guesses on single view of customer for graph for some analytics for marketing. They're not yet pushing that back to your source system. You know, I don't want my, my bill being wrong or my invoice being wrong as a customer because you made an educated guess. I want you to know it's me, you know, think of healthcare even, even more so, right? So um, some interesting use cases and, and use them or evaluate them all, right? And we all get stuck in our rut. And I would say, you know, if any of these are new to you, so much information out there on the web, on data diversity, on, um, you know, on, on good old YouTube. <laughs> How do you spend your week on, on data management YouTube videos? Um, but there's a lot of great, and, and the vendors themselves having knocked them in the beginning. Um, I've learned a lot from the, and the vendors. A lot of them have a lot of great information about their kind of tool patterns. Um, and, and in a, a typical organization, there are many use cases, many data models, um, and, and this is just really a, even just a subset of, of some of the options. But um, you know, as we think of patterns, and that's how I think. If we think of that that uh, that what I'm trying to I can use my words of, of the report or the analytics, you know, visualization in the very beginning of the presentation, 
that might be a starting point. Maybe, maybe your bus matrix is a starting point. Maybe it's a, a you know, user stories or a design thinking workshop or something with your, your users to really understand what you need and then kind of work backwards into, you know, what do we need to support it? Um, you could, again, if you start, I always think left to right is kind of a, a ticket warehousing kind of person, but if your, your operational systems are on the left, again, I might at the bottom have an operational system that is at my accounting system, maybe on a relational database or my CRM system. Why are they on a relational database? Because those are really good for that application. I, I want my bank to know that my uh, I have the right number uh, of, of accounts and I have the right and amount of money in my bank account. Um, I actually have a financial institution that just gave me a set of stocks that I didn't purchase. I'm still wondering what to do with that. So in one sense, I'm glad that I have a whole new set of stocks in my portfolio. Um, but longer term, I'm a little bit nervous working with that financial institution. What sort of governance they have, you know, I assume it's the relational database, but who's governing that? How did I just end up with stocks in my portfolio that I didn't buy? I shouldn't have said that. They don't come find me. Uh, um, so, you know, that, that's one great mistake for relational data. A web application again, maybe that's more of a, a NoSQL, or you know, there's so many different applications there. I probably wouldn't put my you know, everything on my web in a, um, a relational database. And then, how do you kind of move that um, into maybe analytics and reporting? And not necessarily the ETL or, or, or you know, ELT or how you do it, but that data exchange, you know, JSON, XML. There's a lot of different patterns of how you even format the data for. You know, either exchange to another in-house system or um, outside the organization. A lot of industry organizations have kind of XML standards or JSON standards and things like that. Um, uh, and then how do we store for analytics and reporting? A lot of use cases, if you, if you notice at the bottom though, I, I am a, a fan of having some sort of master data or hierarchies or data quality kind of as that hub that can feed some of those. So maybe your, your warehouse is, is kind of a source of truth. Uh, for some of that data, um, but when you're thinking of operational, you really want to think of you know what are those master data, and, and because and we already saw in the examples, almost everything reporting touches. The reason it's called master data and reference data is because it's used everywhere. It's it's master it's, it's that master source and it's referenced by a lot of different areas. So you know, kind of starting with that is going to have a lot of benefit because then where am I, if I want to do a, a star schema, um, those dimensions can come from there. I want to make sure my operational system, um, you know, my my stock trading company knows that I'm Donna Burbank that owns AT&T and not Donna Burbank somewhere who probably lost some stocks because they're there in my portfolio. Still flabbergasted by that one. Um, so get, getting that right is only augmentative, is that a word? It only, only can add um, to, the, to these storage areas for analytics and report. And it doesn't have to be just one, right? And, and again, I mean, some of the negative of data warehousing, which I'm a fan of and it works and it still will work, um, is, you know, is everything a monolithic warehouse? Maybe it's yes and, right? We, we have the, the for financial reporting, we have the corporate warehouse, but maybe I, I want to do um, you know, a, a graph storage for somewhere else or, or, you know, a data vault for a particular use case. It doesn't all have to be the, the same. And then even on the consumption patterns, you know, the good old cube, which is your kind of star scheme approach, your, your bus matrix type approach. I already mentioned kind of flattening it out. Do we want kind of time sequence data sets for certain use cases, graph databases for different patterns, et cetera. Um, again, a lot of different choices. And, and I can't say that any of these are inherently good or bad, but, but mapping it out, again, there's been some good chat. Um, often data quality problems are, are either caused by things nothing to do with how it was stored, um, uh, process or, or, or data definitions, um, could, be, could be how it's stored in, in separate places, et, et cetera. Um, but just mapping it out and making sure you're doing it intentionally can, and can solve a lot of these problems. Um, we had one whiteboarding session with a customer with a great sense of humor, and, and we were mapping out, you know, both the process and the data. And, and you start to map out your data. We've all seen that, you know, the lines and the and the lines, you know, systems going back into themselves and going out around. She goes, "Wow, when you map out what we're doing, we look ridiculous, don't we?" Um, and, and again, I don't think anyone decided to have these these lines going all over the place. But that's the problem. No one really did decide. So, um, you know, e even if it's a quick whiteboarding session or in the back of an envelope still better than not doing it at all. Um, so uh, re really uh, thinking this through was a, only a positive. So um, 
I do want to leave it open for, for questions because I know there generally is a lot and you guys are never a shy crowd. Um, so just quickly in, in summary, you know, analytics and reporting growing and growing in, 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 in importance, uh, that strong data architecture, which is not one monolithic choice. It's, it's a bunch of kind of, dare I say it, a fabric or a mesh of different objects. Um, and there's a lot of different choices that you, you can do just to focus on those core fundamentals. I am as guilty as anyone else, that there's a new cool technology and I wanna use it um, and I'll play around with it. And that's fine to play around with it, um, but, but just make sure the use case you're using it for in your enterprise is the right one and just ch choose that wisely. So before we open it up um, for the, the, the chat and the Q and A, uh, just a blatant plug for the next month session, which is on metadata management. Um, another blatant plug, we do this for a living. So if you need help, think of us at Global Data Strategy. Our website is there. Um, and without further ado, I will send it over to you, Shannon, to open it up for Q&A. Donna, thank you so much for this, another great presentation. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do here. So if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen for either Donna or Abby. And uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, recording, and anything else requested throughout. Donna, uh, so is logical like data views? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. What was that? Yeah, this is it's logical like data views, logical model. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah, yes, and 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 no. So when I was saying when I kind of had that data model slide, um, often logical is sort of used as kind of a shorthand for the the business view. So in that sense, yes, it can be a view on top of your data, but logical in our, it was more, you know, can customer have a pro how do customers and products relate together? Um, I think a view and in one of my buzzwords, I think I had up there was kind of almost more your more semantic layer, right? Which is kind of driven by that logical view. So if, if my logical view is this is how customers and products and, and locations fit together, that might generate some business views that can kind of help drive that semantic layer, which which may drive some views. So that's kind of your, you know, you have your, so, so yes and no, you have your physical layer and then you have a layer on top of it that may, may be instantiated through a view, um, the kind of view, but I was saying the view itself is at the physical layer, um, but the kind of that logic or the business logic is at the, at the more logical layer, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Abby, feel free to jump in on any of these questions where you wanna if you'd like to add. Uh, and are there a good set of question standards for evaluating what is the best solution? That's a great question. Um, not anything I can show off offhand, um, but I mean, some would be, you know, the 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 the, the question I have to start with one of the questions you're you're trying to to answer, you know, and and that's where you know if if the person's saying I want you know the one I keep saying you know products buy thing and you keep hearing this word buy <laughs> that kind of leads towards a um a data warehouse it could be I want you know so one of it is the type of question that's asking asked the other one can be kind of the, the for when you know I always go back well every question the who what where why when <laughs> so the what might be I want, you know, sales by customer. The when might be I need, a, you know, buy the second stock prices so I can make informed decisions. Well, that might be maybe a, a data streaming, you know, and, and so kind of think of it, or maybe your good old fashioned user stories, you know, as a user, I want to, you know, understand my financial um, uh, things I need to report to the street. Well, that's probably a data warehouse. As a user, I want to know instantaneously when there's a cab available at the or an Uber available at the airport. Well, that's probably something much more real time or you know that type of thing. So, kind of a lot of tools in the toolkits, but kind of probably going back to the who, what, where, when, and why. And some of the what might even be you know what am I trying to get if it's in a relational database and I'm summarizing it again. That might be a great warehouse if it's sensor data from our machines and I need, again, real time or something. Um, that, that's always, no matter what question is asked, I like to go back to the who, what, where, why, when, and that's kind of a, a probably a simplest toolkit there. Hopefully that helped. I love it. So, um, 
There's oh, so what is a typical startup time for beginning to use NoSQL options? Looking for uh, to looking to augment relational databases, but enterprise raising concerns about time to value. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, often what what you know is probably a good way to do it. This kind of like exploration phase, and and then trying to scope it into some sort of quick win. Um, and, and and you know that from your company, you know, what, what does fast look like? And that that's something, again, a question I always ask it. And you, you may just have this inherently in you because you work for the company. But I, as a consultant, you know, what is quick? And some folks will say, oh, a year. You know, some folks say a couple of weeks. And so kind of defining, I'm that nerdy data modeler that always clarifies, what do you mean by? <laughs> and so what do you mean by quick? Um, and, and then, you know, m- maybe a, a sort of a proof of concept sandbox, being very careful that sandbox doesn't become production. Um, so one way we, you know, you can, is this, is this technology even su- suited for purpose? So start with that to answer those questions. And then one way to kind of, you know, make sure you can get faster time to market is just scoping some sort of pilot that's small enough that people can see value, you know, by limiting use cases or limiting volume or something. So it's kind of a hard question to answer because it's different for every company, but I, I would say try to get something out in a few months that's at least something you should start to show people and then build for it rather than, you know, build over time. And again, in an architected way, uh, make sure your sandbox doesn't come production, but um, try, try to just limit the scope so you can show some value and, you, and even see if it is the right fit. You know, if it's exploratory, don't make it so big that once at the end of the exploration, you're like, nope, you're in, that's not going to work. You know, I hate the term fail fast and rather have to succeed fast, but, you know, you know, try to scope your use cases small enough to test that out. Tommy, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that was uh, pretty self-sufficient. I love it. Um, so a request here for a topic. Um, we will be putting together topics for 2023 season here soon, but uh, a section on differences between data mesh, like lake house, fabric, et cetera, would be helpful, uh, especially if real type life examples can be shown. Uh, most articles are so confusing. Everything looks all the same. <laughs> anything you want to comment right. on that, Donna? Um, well, it was the plug. We just did, um, what was it? You tell me, uh, Shannon, it was, was it data architecture online? Um, yeah. we, had, we had a, uh, we had a keynote panel just on that topic. Um, and so maybe we can send that in the link. Uh, I don't know if that's available to everybody, but yeah, that's a good, we are going to be putting together topics for next year. So, um, I both love and hate the buzzwords, but they are out there. So maybe some clarity on what they mean would be a good one. And there will be, uh, featured in this year's data architecture online as well, um, pretty consistently throughout the throughout the day. Um, also, so does da- a data lake provide value if you don't have a quote unquote big data storage need, uh, data scientists or analysts wanting to pump in external data and do ad hoc analysis? Um, I think so. Uh, in fact, a lot of folks in the data lake is almost your just your landing area, your good old fashioned landing area of the warehouse. Um, and it could just it could be text based data it could be um non textual data it's 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 a you know that that need for i don't know everything i want to model before i even start and i don't want to lose you know the the beauty of a warehouse is i have it planned and organized um ahead of time but you don't necessarily know all those answers so kind of having that low cost way to you know but it, it's, it's like your closet you don't want to dump too much in there it becomes garbage but um yeah that idea of kind of a data warehouse I mean, I'm sorry, data lake architecture or, you know, so, some especially the cloud systems kind of have that idea of just that that, that storage um, a pattern is, is, I would say, yes, you don't need to even have big quote, <laughs> big data to use a data lake uh, kind of architecture pattern. So in any one of your diagrams, pick one, where you land, inf- where do you land information architecture? Um, where do I land information architecture? Um, there's another word I could have added to that. Um, I, I would say, I mean, data architecture and information architecture co-related. I guess information would be more broad. Uh, you could have documents in there. You could have, so I think probably my my diagrams would, you could say they're information architecture. They probably aren't as broad because I do, don't have things like documents. I didn't have everything in there. I also would say information architecture should definitely look at the semantic layer. I, I suggest information is more holistic than the data, which I tend to think is more of like data in the database or <laughs> data in streaming and things like that. Um, so 
I love it. So it sounds, it looks, everyone's been, oh, we got more questions come in. Oh, but couldn't information architecture not influence master data management? Um, could it not? There was a double negative there that confused me. Um, it, it could, it could, it, <laughs> if I, um, I guess my definition of information is it's broader than data. So it could influence master data management, or it could, if you're just say master, you know, in, information is just documents. You may not have master data, but you would certainly have reference data. Um, and we've used that as kind of having your reference data as your hierarchy is kind of your, your tags for documents and things like that. So I think they should still be um you know related i also just you know so we sometimes we talk in circles with information versus data versus knowledge versus you know, <laughs> um but yeah again mapping it out um i could be neutral on what you call it but yeah i would say data is a subset of the information that's all the questions we have coming in i'll give everyone a quick moment ah and bring Go. I was going to say that'll uh, be a first that we got all that. Questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, which technical certification do you consider, if any? Oh, um, th there's a lot out there. Where there's the um, you know the, the data. Um, DEMA CDMP, which is kind of your certified data management professional. I like that because that's your, your sort of broad. Uh, TWI has some great uh, certifications, especially around data warehousing. I also, again, we both love and hate the vendors. I do think a lot of the vendor certifications, um, you know, are you cloud certified? I guess I can say some of the names are big enough, you know, AWS and, and Google and, and Azure. Um, you know, I think, and, and we do a lot of hiring, the perfect architect in this world can do both, right? I know the fundamentals or even just university courses and, and relational algebra and some of those theories if you know that and i and i know what master data if i here's my perfect candidate <laughs> i i know what relational algebra is i also know you know data science fundamentals and, and graph patterns and all of that so i know like the academic principles i know enough of cdmp that i know the difference between data government uh, data uh, master data and reference data and i know the dimensions of data quality and I could open up something like you know Azure and understand all of the the architectural patterns and be able to know when to use a key value versus document versus again I'm talking about a unicorn, <laughs> um, but I think some sort of mix of those of the theory and some of the tools because you know the tools are hot and they have their own um, you know and I would almost question someone that you know said they're an architect but doesn't have any certificate like doesn't they've never used one of the platforms like you got to roll up your sleeves and have done it right so hopefully that's a good good mix and again a lot of it is out there and a lot of it is very low cost or some of them are even free so hopefully that helps very helpful thank you and uh Perfect timing, because that's going to bring us right to the top of the hour here. Thanks to everyone again for being so engaged in everything. We do love the chat that's been going on as always. Um, and just a reminder, again, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thank you to Katana Graph for sponsoring today's webinar. Thank you, Abby, for joining us. A pleasure. And I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.